Welcome to Distributed SQL Summit Asia. My name is Alan Caldera. Today I'll be presenting a presentation on migrating to Yugabyte DB from Oracle. In today's presentation, we'll answer some questions around why, uh, why you should migrate and why, or we'll ask some questions around why you will migrate, uh, our architectural differences, schema migration, application considerations, and some data migration tips. So the first question you should ask yourself when you're considering migrating to distributed SQL is what do I hope to gain? Uh, do, I hope to help, do I hope to gain scalability where my application has reached saturation on a single node and therefore I need more connections or I need to shard databases artificially, i.e. on some uh, artificial key like groups of customers or something like that? Uh, is it because I need more res resiliency? Uh, my business needs uh, more tolerance of infrastructure failure, or I need to reduce uh, downtime for maintenance windows, like for operating system patches and database system upgrades, or am I just looking for more flexibility? I'm transitioning from a monolithic app to uh, to a more modern architecture where potentially I might want to uh, use different APIs. Okay, so now we're gonna talk about some architectural differences between SMP databases like Oracle and Postgres and Yugabyte DB. In most SMP databases, you have a single node uh, that has a query layer that's running in shared memory attached to some local disk, uh, like we demonstrate in on with Postgres there on the left-hand side of the diagram. In Yugabyte DB, we are sharding this query layer across multiple machines uh, where each machine has a different portion of the uh, table stored underneath it. This differs from Oracle Rack Oracle Rack also will have a distributed query architecture where you can attach to different nodes, but they are all looking at a single unified uh, copy of the disk underneath. So in Yugabyte DB, every table that you create is automatically sharded, sharded. and so each uh, so we have two kinds of sharding that occurs. Uh, we have hash sharding and range sharding. So when we shard tables in Ubyte, uh, we typically recommend that you, that you partition on hash keys and these hash keys are specified by the primary key definition for the table. So the default for any index constraint definition uh, is the first column in that index uh, for the hash key. Other columns can be specified if you use uh, additional syntax where you group certain columns uh, together to, to, to declare a hash key. Uh, but if you do not specify this syntax, then it will be just the first column. It is important to note that uh, the cardinality of this column will make a big difference as to how many uh, partitions you end up with, i.e. don't use uh, something like a Boolean or something that's got a low number of values. Otherwise, you end up with a very small number of uh, potential uh, tablets. If no primary key is specified, then we generate a pseudo internal row ID that is used to partition the table. Tables can also be range sharded with tablet splits where we can specify uh, a syntax with split at, but it is usually difficult to know the best, best split points at uh, design time. So tablet splitting uh, will occur based on sizes of tables and this is uh, controlled by uh, server uh, uh, settings specified uh, during creation. So let's talk about data types. So when we map uh, Oracle data types to Yugabyte types, there are a couple of key rules that we need to keep in mind. Uh, 
for the most part, uh, text type uh, text type columns will will be will come over natively without uh, too much trouble. Uh, we don't have any special specification as far as the difference between uh, characters that can be single uh, single byte characters and multi byte characters. This is handled at a different layer. Uh, we don't support large objects. We'll talk about a little bit more about that in, the, in a bit. Uh, the by far the most difficult uh, thing to get right between Oracle and Yugabyte is uh, the numerics. So in numerics, uh, we're talking about things like decimals, uh, uh, in decimal, you know, decimal 38, number 38. Uh, these, uh, these types use uh, different storage formats. And, and so the uh, limits on the limits on the uh, size of them can be different uh, depending on the uh, implementation. In particular, number uh, 38, which is a very common uh, uh, sequence number that is found in Oracle applications, is actually a 128-bit uh, unsigned value. So its limits of uh, values are usually uh, far beyond uh, what a what other applications can do, so uh, we usually need to be uh, careful about how we convert those over. Uh, most of the other data types are fairly straightforward, um, mapping to either plain uh, varchar types or uh, the equivalent uh, uh, double precision or um, you know, small float type values. The next thing we wanted to discuss is primary key definitions. So the problem is that Yugabyte DB does not support adding the primary key after table definition. Uh, so our general solution is that we want, we ask you to create, do a schema only dump and then move the primary def key definitions into the definition for the table in the create table statement. Uh, this is because we will actually create the table to be indexed organized according to the specification that we give that you give us. Uh, we do have an open GitHub issue on this where we are looking at uh, allowing you to change the definition right after the uh, table is created. Uh, but before any data is loaded, uh, and this can be looked up on GitHub issue 1104. Uh, but for the meantime, always specify your primary key in the create table definition. Let's discuss uh, the sort order for the various indexes, including primary key. Uh, in Yugabyte DB, the sort order for the primary key or the index of a table determines the data distribution strategy for that object across the nodes. The problem is that if you just use uh, ascending or descending sort orders without hash, uh, is that this will place the uh, object in a single shard on a particular node. This is because in a distributed architecture, there is no way to guarantee order across uh, across a distributed system without it being just in one place. Now, as we I mentioned earlier, we do support tablet splitting on size because it is uh, difficult to understand. It is difficult to pre-plan where these split points uh, will happen but uh, we always want you to specify a hash in, a, in addition to a index, um, in, in addition to an index order. Uh, so, you know, typically the way to do that would be, you would have some one to many columns in the specified as the hash and then all subsequent columns as being ascending or uh, descending. The next issue we want to discuss is that we have a large number of tables and indexes in a lot of applications. 
And so with this number of objects, Yugabyte DB will by default create a very large number of shards or tablets for every node, for every table. So if you have uh, each one of these shards will basically have to report its status to the YB master process every half a second. So this can have a very negative uh, impact on performance. So if we're talking about, you know, tens of tables, it's not a, not a concern. If we're talking about hundreds or even thousands of tables and indexes, this can become a problem very quickly. So what we want to generally do is, in those, t in those cases. For a lot of these small tables, it's really not beneficial to distribute, uh, distribute the table at all, especially if it's less than a million rows. So what we, what we suggest is to use the co-location property, i.e. Uh, create database with co-location, co-located equals true, uh, to basically put all the smaller tables in, in the co-located database and then the true distributed tables, the large uh, tables that, the tables that will grow large over time, we want to actually split out and say, these are not co-located. The next issue we run into is that uh, or databases like Oracle like to support uh, collation, you know, especially naturally, you know, localized uh, language collation sequences. We do not currently uh, support that, but we will so do so in the future. Uh, we also do not sp support any specific table uh, table space uh, definitions at this time. So if, when you're doing your migration, we want you to actually remove the, uh, any uh, uh, sp special storage parameters in this case. The last issue that we want to talk about in schema migration is the con is the um, is the use of identity columns. Uh, these are typically surrogate keys, uh, and so when you make you do your first, uh, typically when you do a migration uh, and you cr create it, you know, in Postgres you will create a sequence, uh, and by default it will actually say, okay, I want a sequence number to create to uh, control the generation of this surrogate key. And the default cache value is typically one. Uh, this presents a lot of problems for a distributed system like you go uh, because each, uh, because there is only one master source uh, for the sequence number, and this would be in the catalog in YB master. So every time that you go and ask for a new sequence number, then it must make an RPC call to the YB master in order to uh, satisfy that request. So what we do is we say, okay, you need to alter the sequence uh, to basically cache uh, a number of values uh, so that uh, when the uh, request is made, it doesn't have to go and fetch that uh, fetch that value every so often. It only has to fetch that value every so often. Uh, the second way we can solve this is to use a UUID instead of a sequence object. This way that you don't have any uh, issues with actually having to uh, generate uh, you know, a standard number. Uh, and the keys are uh, you know, guaranteed, guaranteed to be more unique. This specifically becomes important when you're using features like our X cluster replication product, where you have two independent clusters. And when you have two independent clusters, there is no way to guarantee uh, that you will have different sequence numbers uh, being generated on, uh, on each cluster. Uh, the performance impact of this is, is actually fairly profound. Uh, so when you, I'll give you an example. So recently we were doing a migration with a customer and they had a, uh, a sequence number with a cache value of one and they were only getting 
uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of 100 rows per second. We increased the cash value to uh, 10,000 and they immediately jumped up without changing any code. They immediately jumped up to doing 800 records per second. So uh, this is very important. Uh, lastly, we want to talk about uh, uh, clob and blob column types. Uh, so we do not support these large object types. So what we want you to use instead is either text or byte array or JSONB instead. Uh, so by default, we can support message sizes up to 32 megabytes. So if your objects fit within the, that size, uh, then those types should suffice for you. Um, if they don't, uh, then what you will want to do is you will want to decompose those objects into smaller elements that can be portioned out with uh, point lookups. So instead of having one big large uh, clob column, maybe you have a uh, different, you know, use a different uh, column to indicate, okay, well, maybe this is part one, this is part two, this is part three, and you decompose uh, the record further into uh, smaller, uh, smaller types. Generally, this has uh, not been a, an issue to date. So the next thing we want to watch about, watch out for are Oracle cartridges and extensions that require special indexes. The problem is, is that there are some indexes that, that require that involve geospatial or special text search capabilities that require either GIN, which is an inverted index, or GIST, which is a geospatial bounding box or R tree type index. These are currently on the roadmap for Yugabyte DB. Uh, as they are designed for, uh, typically designed for uh, the structure of a single node database uh, like Oracle. Uh, so uh, the solution is we can use these types uh, and the actual functions without the index, but they will almost always result in a full relation scan. Uh, so if you have other columns that uh, can be used to on other non-spatial columns that can be used to restrict uh, the uh, search. You know, perhaps even bringing out uh, the latitude and longitude is a specific uh, value, and using you know standard less than greater than logic, um, and then you know further uh, constraining it later with a, a spatial query uh, that will work uh, just fine. So let's talk about some application considerations. So in Oracle, the benefit of using prepared statements is not readily uh, as apparent since every, you know, all of the catalog information is stored on the local node. So in the distributed world, uh, the catalog metadata is held on a, in a common location, in our case, YV master. So each statement incurs a network RPC call during the parse phase. So every, so every time you go in and execute a statement, we must parse it, uh, plan it. Uh, this also requires additional, uh, uh, additional resources. And so, you know, the big thing here is that, you know, it's not the time so much, it's the latency uh, from, one, uh, uh, from one system to another, because your catalog may not be uh, in the same data center as the where the application is running. So the solution here is to use a driver that can auto prepare the statements or use uh, the prepare bind execute paradigm explicitly. Uh, in cases where the driver will not auto prepare, then we uh, indicate that you should use the uh, server side prepare. So here's an example. So let's say I create uh, two tables and I want to uh, join them. So uh, typically what we'll see in an application is, uh, you know, you will have a, um, you know, some kind of for loop where we'll say, okay, join these two tables on the keys. And then, you know, the value will actually be uh, passed into the statement each time that it's uh, sent. 
So what we recommend that you do is prepare the statement beforehand uh, and then use uh, markers, uh, variable markers within the uh, statement so that uh, the statements can be planned once, uh, parsed and planned once, and then executed multiple times. This can uh, help your performance greatly. The next thing we want to discuss is a large number of concurrent connections. Usually this is, uh, this comes up uh, about uh, the second call or so when we uh, are talking with a potential prospect is they want to know how many connections can we support. So by default, we uh, can handle uh, 300 connections uh, per T server. So if you have a, uh, if you have a, uh, a three node system, which is the minimum size, then potentially we could handle 900 connections right off the bat. I will say that there is a uh, proviso on that uh, in that uh, this is geared around having a very small number of databases, i.e. one, uh, and because each database that gets each additional database adds additional information that must be uh, sent to the uh, sent to the remote client each time they make a connection. So the more databases that you have, uh, the less number of connections you will be able to support uh, per T server. So in a, micro, in a microservices architecture, which is where we're typically uh, seeing U of ITB deploy, this is not a concern. Uh, in, if you are looking at a case where you want to support many different uh, databases, then our recommendation is to use, um, is to use schemas rather than uh, specific, uh, than different databases. The other thing that we that you should be looking at using is using a connection pool like Hikari. Um, so this will dramatically reduce the number of actual connections that you need to make to the database. Um, and then lastly, what we also say, if you want to, instead of looking at increasing the actual number of connections uh, per node, then at the point where you feel like you don't have enough connections, then you really should be looking at increasing the number of nodes. So it using, you know, using more nodes uh, will make, uh, will make more for better scalability other than just increasing the load on uh, the additional, the existing uh, tablet servers. So the next problem we want to consider is how to distribute load, load evenly across the cluster. Uh, the problem is, is that most uh, SQL drivers are not cluster aware and they're designed to uh, connect to a single point. This is different from uh, Cassandra, which grew up being a distributed, uh, a distributed architecture and therefore its driver was designed to connect to many different nodes. Uh, so for uh, for applications like Postgres that grew up in the single node world, uh, there's a couple, there's three different solutions we can use. One is we can use a round robin load balancer like HA Proxy or Nginx, or perhaps even a cloud based load balancer if you are in a uh, cloud like uh, AWS, GCP, or Azure. Uh, the second way is you can modify the query, the application to distribute the queries across the nodes. Uh, so this could be done by creating a local DNS entry uh, that has a list of all of the nodes uh, that uh, belong to a particular cluster. Um, and so when you, if you want to go look at uh, what nodes are available, you can look at you know, look through our uh, Cassandra API at the system.peers table, and that will tell you all of the different uh, uh, nodes that are currently present in the cluster. Um, the third way is to use uh, some driver-specific functionality to do load balancing. In particular, 
uh, JDBC for Postgres allows you to specify multiple hosts either for failover or for load balancing. And so there's a special uh, uh, setting called load balance hosts. If you set it to true, it will actually go across all of the nodes that you specify in that particular JDBC URL. Otherwise, it will do a, uh, a simple failover. So the next thing we wanted to discuss is retrying transactions on conflicts. So typically, Oracle will use uh, pessimistic locking with either row or table locks with the ability to wait on those locks. Uh, we do not currently have those supported, so we generally use optimistic locking, which provides much better performance. But when conflicts are actually detected, then we will basically abort uh, one of the transactions. And typically that would be the one that is submitted last. Uh, so when you, what your application should be doing is it should always be looking to retry uh, transactions uh, when, uh, when conflicts are, are detected. And it's a good idea anyway, because unlike other databases, you know, if in a, in a SMP database type case, if your application is, uh, if your application is, if your database is down, your application is down. Uh, in our case, uh, you, if you get a negative response from the database, it's not because the database is down, it's because the database actually moved your workload somewhere else. Because you know, with Ubyte being distributed, it can move things from one node uh, to another. So at that point when you receive an error, then you should look to retry. And part of this will be, you know, I might have to reconnect uh, as well. In the long term, we are look, working on ways to uh, transparently uh, handle these conditions. Uh, but uh, for the most part, what you should be looking to do in your applications is to handle these types of exceptions like serialization failure or fail to contact host and basically just retry uh, the transaction from the uh, beginning. So the next thing we want to talk about is watching out for hierarchical queries. So this would be, in particular, this would be uh, about uh, connect by. We can simulate this syntax in one of two ways. Uh, given the following table definition, where you have an employee number with a, that's the primary key, and then a manager number, which has a foreign key that references uh, that primary key, we can do one of two things. We can use a recursive uh, CTE or common table expression, or we can use a, uh, a special extension with, within Postgres uh, that called table funk that allows you to basically simulate uh, the connect by function. So here's, uh, here's an example of this. So with a recursive table, common table expression, we can basically do what we call the, uh, the base case where you start, uh, in our case, since we're gonna start from a manager, um, you know, so we're gonna start, basically start from the guy that has no manager, i.e. The, the big boss at the top. Um, and then we're going to loop through uh, each, uh, each person that reports uh, to that particular person. Uh, so uh, we're going to uh, recurse on that, on that uh, second statement and then materialize that. That's the first method. The second method is to use this, uh, this table funk extension within Postgres. Uh, and then you can say select star from connect by and then you give it a table specification with the uh, fields that do the connection as well as a level of numbers uh, and then how you want to actually display it at the end. Let's talk about uh, some data migration tips. Uh, so let's consider schema first, make sure your 
all your tables and indexes are created ahead of time uh, in order to make your loading go faster, disable all your foreign keys and triggers uh, before loading data. You want to order, try and order your data by the primary key. Uh, data that's sorted by the primary key uh, will load faster because it will get written as a larger batch of rows. Uh, in the, uh, we also, if you're going to use copy, uh, so Yugabyte DB supports the copy statement uh, to load data. So we want to basically take advantage of the fact that we're running across multiple nodes. So we want to split those uh, files into multiple parts so we can use multiple copy statements to run those uh, uh, in parallel across the cluster. Uh, for programmatic batch inserts, we want to use multi-row inserts whenever possible to do the batching. So in JDBC in particular, there's a uh, flag called rewrite batch insert statements to true. And we have found that a batch size of 128 is optimal. Uh, we want you to typically use uh, sim simple inserts and avoid insert on conflict. We do support that, but uh, there are some corner cases with that right now. And then finally, when doing counts, uh, raise your statement timeout. Uh, in particular, uh, there's a, a G flag called uh, client read write timeout MS, which basically controls the uh, amount of time that will wait uh, before timing out a particular statement. Uh, so when we do uh, an operation like select count star, uh, it has to go across all of the uh, fragments for the table. So each uh, shard, it will do this in parallel, but every shard must be, uh, must be scanned as a relation scan. So uh, we need to uh, give the uh, statement more time to, uh, uh, to execute in that case. So data migration tips. So the other, the last thing we want to talk about is uh, using third-party tooling like Blitz. So Blitz provides an enterprise edition of their cloud-native replication product called Replicant. Uh, there is a license fee for developers that are migrating from a closed source database like Oracle to Yugabyte DB. But what it provides you is it provides you the ability to do a fully parallel initial snapshot load, CDC-based transactional data replication, autonomous schema and index remappings. Uh, and then it also allows you to uh, do some uh, uh, do some fault tolerant uh, replications as well. Um, here's a map of the different features that are supported between uh, developer and enterprise. So at this point, I'm, I will open the floor to any uh, Q&A for this uh, particular presentation.